Okay, more stuff in the heart of chapter 9, the unemployment question and the inflation question. Remember what we're doing here is talking about how to measure what's going on. If we want to say the economy is doing well, not doing well, needs this, needs that, doesn't need, we have to have some way to measure what's going on. So we already talked about GDP and its components, and now we have unemployment and inflation. These are not, not the only things we use to measure. They're just the most common, maybe the most important. Okay, so I know you're writing. You shouldn't, but you are. If, if, um, a new Kardashian is born, so we get, you know, southwest, east-west, whatever the next one is. And they're a little baby. Should we consider them to be unemployed? They didn't get a job, right? When you get them from the hospital, get out of that crib. Come on, get to work. Probably not. Probably not. Now, I used that kid as an example and we'll come back in a second but what we're going to do is take anybody who's under 16 and we're going to say look they can't be unemployed no matter what that person under 16 does they cannot be unemployed okay pure and simple cannot cannot not have a job we're not concerned if they have a job now we might count them and why I use that Kardashian example is the second that little Kardashian is born, their parents probably sign a contract between them and the Kardashian network, whatever network they're on. And that kid, every time that kid appears in the show, then they're going to get paid. And every time that show is in reruns over the next tavern long, that kid's going to get paid. And every time somebody downloads or streams an episode of that, that kid's going to get paid. Okay? So the government might want to count that kid as being employed, but under no circumstances is anyone under 16 ever counted as being unemployed. Okay? And then we have some other people that we don't want to count. What if you're in a coma? Are you unemployed? Should they use you for something while you're there? What if you're in prison? There are people who are what we call institutionalized. So they're sick, they're mentally ill, they're in prison, something. They can't participate in the labor force in a productive way because they're institutionalized. Okay. So what are we going to do with these people? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to redefine the population of a country. And we're going to redefine the population of a country to ignore anybody under 16 and anyone who is institutionalized. Okay? So we're going to get rid of the under 16s and the institutionalized. And that creates something called the non-institutional population or the non-institutionalized population. Usually you see the word civilian in this. So most of the tables that you come across will say civilian non-institutional population. Here's the deal. If you're in the military, you're essentially institutionalized. You can't not have a job if you're in the military because you're in the military. You don't go look. You're in the military. Okay? You're institutionalized. And, and if you're, you know, over 16 but you're a full-time student, right, we might count you as institutionalized as well. Now, the reason that we stick the word civilian on there to remind us is that many years ago, Ronald Reagan was president, and we didn't get enough. He said, he said that he was going to create 5 million new jobs his first term, and he hadn't. So how to create jobs? Well, the easiest way to create jobs is just change the way we count who has a job. And so he switched the system so the military counted in the, in the, in the computation. Okay? Not the first president to play with the numbers and not the last president. But that meant for a period of years, we were counting the military 
as employed. And then we went back to doing it the way we're supposed to do it, which is without the military. So just because there's data out there that has the military counted in different ways, most of the time now we write the word civilian on our tables so that everybody knows that the military is not in the data in this table. Okay? So we've got a civilian non-institutional population that's the population of the country minus everybody under 16 and minus the people who are institutionalized, including the military. Got it? Good. The definition, the civilian non-institutional population is defined as a person 16 years of age and older residing in the 50 states in the District of Columbia who are not inmates of institutions or who are not on active duty in the armed forces. So that's... Uh, not quite what your book says, but this is the truth. All right? So your book says that some of those people, like being in prison, is um, out of the labor force, but it's not. Okay? It's non-institutional population. All right. Now we're going to take that non-institutional population and we're going to split it into two parts. We're going to call one part the force, the labor force. So the force is with us. <sighs> And then, because we're very clever, we economists, the, everybody else who's not in this force is either called out of the labor force or not in the labor force, depending on what language you like. It's the same deal. You're either not in the labor force or you're out of the labor force. Not very creative. but So this whole non-institutional population, part of it goes into the labor force and part of it is out of the labor force. Now, what's that mean? Good question. So the labor force gets split up. The labor force is people who are employed and people who are unemployed. And if you're saying to yourself, now wait a second, isn't that everybody? No. There's three groups of people. There's the employed, there's the unemployed, and then there's the people who are not in the labor force. And we'll talk about what that means in a second. Remember that everybody over six, 16 or over, right, is in the non-institutionalized population. That means if you're 90, as long as you're not institutionalized, right? So if you're 90 and you're still living on your own and whatever, but you haven't worked in 30 years, you're not employed. You're not really unemployed, right? You're not in the labor force, okay? So the labor force is the employed plus the unemployed. We need to define what those two words mean, okay? So employed. To be employed, you have to work outside the home for pay at least one hour a week. So the trick here is you have to get paid, and you don't actually have to leave your house. If you're a nerd and you live in your mom's basement and you do, you know, web design, if your customers are outside the home, you're employed. All right, so if your mom gives you a dollar to take out the garbage, you're not employed. Your customers are not outside your home. But, but, as long as your customers are outside the home and you work at least one hour a week, that's all you have to work to be employed. One hour a week. Got it? One hour a week. One hour each week. How do you get to be unemployed? Well, first you have to be not employed. That seems logical. And then you must be actively seeking employment. If you get fired from your job and you collect unemployment insurance, one of the things they will ask you every week when you get your unemployment is whether you look for work that week. And they'll expect you to document that this is what I did and this is what I did. I applied for this job and this job and this job and this job. If you say to them, you know, I'm not looking for work anymore, you're not unemployed anymore and you're not entitled to unemployment. Okay? To be unemployed, you have to be not employed but actively seeking. Okay? I had a um, professor in the years ago who got fired from his job and every night he'd go out to a bar and he'd ask the bar if they were hiring economists and they used to have a form back then and he would get the bartender to sign off that they weren't hiring economists and that was how he was proving he was actively seeking employment in every bar in town okay but the trick is you have to be actively seeking employment you have to be looking for work now, how do we know this? Well, mostly we know this through something called the Current Population Survey. 
the government calls about 60,000 people a month. Okay? And they identify you by your street address. I am actually currently in the current population survey. I'm in the current current survey. All right? What they do is they call you for four months in a row. And it's the same week every month. So it's like the third week of the month they call you every month for four months. And they ask you, did you work last month? Do you have a, if you know, if you do that, do you have more than one job? What are your jobs? What many hours did you work? Okay. All of those kind of employment questions. If you said, no, I didn't work. Then they ask you about, did you look for work? Did you do this? Did you do that? Are you, okay? And so they're asking you all these questions about your employment situation. And coupled with that, the, when they first talk to you, they get your demographics, right? So they, they go, yeah, old white guy, okay? For four months you do this. And they ask you extra questions. So one month they ask you about your income, one month they might ask you about your house and do you live in an apartment or a house? How many rooms does it have? How many bathrooms does it have? How many floors does it have? Right? They ask you all these sorts of questions. And then there might be special questions because every they're constantly doing these special surveys. And so one month they might ask you about, you know, your restaurant eating out or something. Okay? But every month they're going to ask you these employment questions and then they're going to ask you another set of questions that come from the Census Bureau, not from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Okay, So they do this for four months and then you take eight months off and you don't answer any questions for eight months and then you come back online and you answer questions for four more months. Okay. I had a lot of fun doing this. The fir my first four months, I'm in my third month of not being questioned, but I had a lot of fun doing it because I would talk to the, the person, the woman who was my person, and we would talk on the phone to do answer the questions. And then I would tell her about what I had told my class about her the last month. So every month I was relaying to my class what we had talked about while we were taking the CPS. So, really cool. Now, let me be clear. These data are probably inaccurate. So let's think for a minute. You are talking on the phone with somebody from the U.S. government. You are one of those people who lie on your income tax. You work at a club here in Vegas, a day club at the pool, and you're getting these you know, you're getting hundreds and hundreds and maybe thousands of dollars in tips every day and you're not reporting them. Are you going to tell the CPS people the truth or are you going to be afraid that they might tell the IRS the truth? Okay? So you might not, you might not tell them. If you're one of those guys who works construction but you're working, you know, kind of under the table, you get paid in cash every day, are you going to tell the CPS people that you did that? Maybe not. All right. So there's questions. And if they ask you about your income, might you lie? Yeah, you might. All right. So there's, yeah. there's reasons why this might not be as perfect as we would like it to be. All right. But it's what we do. And there's a lot of people in the survey, right? So there's no question that there's lots of people scattered all over the country. But again, they find you at your address, your physical address. So if you're homeless or something like that, you can't be in this. All right. All right. They also do what's called the establishment survey. And that means that they check out about 300,000 businesses around the country every year, every month. Sorry, not every year. 300,000 businesses every month. And they ask them about how many people they have working. So that's about employment. It's a way to back up the employment numbers. It doesn't tell you anything about unemployment, really, but it gives you data about employment and how people are employed. Exciting? 